Chapter 17 In the cool, starry evenings, the campers sat around a blazing fire and told and listened to stories thrillingly fit to the dark crags in the wild solitude. Monty Price had come to shine brilliantly as a storyteller. He was an atrocious liar, but this fact would have not been evident to his enthralled listeners of his cowboy compadres in base jealousy had not betrayed him. The truth about his remarkable f fabrications, however, had not become known to Castleton, solely because of the Englishman's obtuseness. And there was another thing much stranger than this and quite as amusing. Dorothy Combs knew Monty was a liar, but she was so fascinated by the glittering eyes he riveted upon her, so taken in by his horrible tales of blood that, despite her knowing, she could not have helped but believe them. Manifestly, Monty was very proud of this suddenly acquired grift. Formerly, he had been hardly been known to open his lips in the presence of strangers. Monty had developed more than one singular and hitherto unknown trait since his supremacy at golf had revealed his possibilities. He was as sober and vain and pompous about his captivity for lion as about anything else. Some of the cowboys were jealous of him because he held the attention and apparently the admirations of the ladies. Nels was jealous, not because Monty made himself out to be a wonderful gunman, but because Monty could tell a story. Nels really had been the hero of a hundred fights. He had never been known to talk about them, but Dorothy's eyes and Helen's smile had somehow upset his modesty. Whenever Monty would begin to talk, Nels would growl and knock his pipe on a log and make it appear he could not stay and listen, though he never really left the charming circle of the campfire. Wild horses couldn't have dragged him away. One evening, at twilight, as Madeline was leaving her tent, she encountered Monty. Evidently, he'd weighed later. With the most mysterious of signs and whispers, he led her a little aside. "'Miss Hammond, I'm making bold of asking you a favor,' he said. Madeline smiled her willingness. "'Tonight, when they're all shot off their chins and it's quiet like, I want you to ask me just this way. Monty, seeing as you've had more adventures than in all the other cowpunchers here together, tell us about the most terrible time you ever had. Would you ask me, Miss Hammond, just kind of sincere-like? Certainly I will, Monty, she replied. His dark, seared face had no more warmth than a piece of cold volcanic rock which it resembled. Madeline appreciated how monstrous Dorothy found this burned and distorted vintage. How disformed this little man looked to a woman of refined sensibilities. It was difficult for Madeline to look into his face. But she saw behind the blackened mask. And now she saw in Monty's deep eyes a spirit of pure fun. So, true to her word, Madeline remembered at an opportunity moment when conversation had hushed and only the long, dismal wail of coyotes broke the silence to turn towards the little cowboy. Monty, she said, and paused for effect. Monty, seeing that you've had more adventures than all of the other cowboys together, tell us about the most terrible thing you ever did see. Monty appeared startled at the question that fastened all the eyes upon him, and he waved a desperation hand. Ah, oh, Miss Hammonds, thank you all the modest like for the compliment that I'll have to refuse, replied Monty, laboring in distress. It's it's too harrowing for tender hearted girls to listen to. Go on, everyone cried out except the cowboys. Nels began to nod his head as if he, as well as Monty, understood human nature. Dorothy hugged her nears with a kind of a shudder. Monty had fastened the hypnotic eyes upon her. Castleton ceased smoking and adjusted his eyeglass and prepared to listen in great earnest. 
Monty changed his seat to one where the light from the fire fell upon his face, and he appeared plunging into melancholy and profound thought. Well, now I tax myself. I can't just decide which is the right time I ever had, he said reflectively. Here Nels blew forth an immense cloud of smoke as if he desired to hide himself from sight. Monty pondered, and then when the smoke rolled away he turned to Nels. See here, old partner, you and me seen something of each other on the panhandle maybe thirty year ago. Which we didn't, interrupted Nels bluntly. Sure, you can't make me out an old man. Well, maybe it wasn't darn so long. Anyways, Nels, you recollect them three horse thieves I hung all at one cotton tree? And likewise that beautiful blonde girl I rescued from a band of cutthroats who murdered her pa, old Bill Warren, the buffalo hunter? Now, which of them two scraps was the terriblest in your idea? Monty, my memory's sure bad, replied Nels. Tell us about the beautiful blonde, cried at least three of the ladies. Dorothy, who had suffered from nightmares because of the former story of hanging men on trees, had voicelessly appealed to Monty to spare her more of that. All right, we'll have the blonde girl, said Monty, settling back. Though I ain't think this story is most terriblest of the two. It'll sure rake over tender affections long slumbered in my breast, though. As he paused, there was a short, rapping sound. This appeared to be Nell's knocking the ashes out of his pipe on a stump, a true indication of the past and of contentment from the jealous cowboy. It was down there on the panhandle, way over in the west end of that there Comanche hunting ground, and all the redskins and outlaws in that country was hiding in the river bottoms and chasing some of the last buffalo herds that had wintered in there. I was a young buck then and pretty much a desperado, I'm thinking. So, all the seventeen notches on my gun and each one of them notches they meant a man killed face to face. There was one, only that I was ashamed of. That was for an express messenger who I hit on the head most unprofessional-like, and just when he wouldn't hand over a little package. I heard the kind of reputation that made all the feathers in saloons smile and buy drinks. Well, I dropped into a place named Taylor Bend, and it was a peaceful there standing at the bar when three cowpunchers come in and being with my back turned. They didn't recognize me and got kind of playful. I didn't stop drinking and I didn't turn square around, but when I stopped shooting under my arm, the saloon keeper had to go over to the sawmill and fetch a heap of sawdust to cover up what was left of them there cowpunchers after they was hauled out, of course. You see, I was rough them days and would shoot the ears and noses off and hands as well, which in later days... I'd just kill a man kind of quick, and the same as Wild Bill, you know. News had drifted into town that night that a gang of cutthroats had murdered old Bill Warren and carried off his girl. I gathered up a few gunmen, and we rid out and down the river bottom to an old log cabin where the outlaws had himself a rendezvous. Yeah, so we kind of rolled up bold like and made hell of a racket, and then the gang began to throw lead from the cabin, and we all hunted cover. Fighting went on into the night, and in the morning, all my outfit was killed but two, and they was shot up bad. We fought all day without eating and drinking, except perhaps some whiskey I had, and at night I was on the job by my lonesome. Being bunged up some myself, I laid off and went down to the river to wash the blood off and tie up my wounds and have a wee drink. While I was down there along, one of them cutthroats comes along with a bucket, and instead of getting water, he got lead, and he was about to croak when he tells me a whole bunch of outlaws was handed in there due tomorrow, and if I wanted to rescue that girl, I'd best hurry. There was five feathers left in that cabin. So, 
I went back to the thicket to where I'd left my horse and loaded up two more guns in another belt and busted out a fresh box of shells. If I recall proper, I got some cigarettes too. So I moseyed down to the cabin. Oh, it was a beautiful moonshiny night, and I wondered if old Bill's girl was as pretty as I'd heard. The grass had growed long around the cabin, and I crawled up to the door without starting anything, and then I figured. There was only one door in that cabin, and it was black as dark inside. I just grabbed hold of the door and slipped in quick. It worked all right. They heard me, but hadn't been quick enough to catch me in the light of the door. Of course, there were some shots, and I ducked too quick and then changed my position. Ladies and gentlemen, that there was some duel by night, and I wasn't often in the place where they shot. I was most a wonderful patient and just waited until one of them darn ruffians was getting so nervous that he'd, he'd have to hunt me up. When morning come, they was all piled up on the floor, all shot to pieces, and I found a girl. Pretty. Whew! Say, was she be beautiful. We went down to the river where she began to bathe my wounds. I clicked in a dozen or so, and, and the sight of the tears in her lovely eyes and me blood streaked in her little hands just naturally weakened a trembling spell in my heart. I seen she took the same way, and that settled it. We was coming up from the river, and I had just straddled my horse with the girls behind me when we run right into that cutthroat gang that was due after them. About some handcuffing, and I couldn't drop no more than one gun round on them, and then I had to slope. The whole gang followed me, and miles out there chasing me over a ridge right into the herd of buffalo. Before I know what was what, that herd broke into a stampede with me in the middle. Pretty soon the buffalo closed in tight, and I knowed I was in some peril then. But the girl, she trusted me something pitiful. Seen again that she had fell in love with me, I could tell from the way she hugged on and yelled. Before long, I was some put to to keep my horse on his feet. Far as I could see was dusty black bobby scragging humps, and a huge cloud of dust went along over our heads. That roar of them trampling hooves was terrible. My horse weakened and went down and was carried along a little while I slept off with the girl onto the backs of them there buffalo. Ladies, I ain't denying that Monty Price was some scared first time in my life. But the trusting face of that there beautiful girl as she lay in my arms and hugging me and yelling made my spirit leap like a shooting star. I just began to jump from buffalo to buffalo. I must have had to jump a mile of them bobbing backs before I come to an open place. And here's where I performed the greatest stunts of in my life. I had on me some big old spurs, so I just sat down and rid and spurred till that pecker licking buffalo and I was off gotten to getting another, and then I flopped her over. Thusly, I got to the edge of the herd and tumbled off that last one and I rescued that girl. Well, as my memory takes me back, that was most perfect walk home to the little town where she lived. But she wasn't true to me, and she went and married another feller. I was too much of a sport to kill him, but that low-down trick rankled in my breast. Girls be strange. I've never stopped wondering how any girl who would have hugged and kissed one man, could go and marry another. But experience teaches me that such is the case. The cowboys roared. Helen and Miss Beck and Edith laughed until they cried. Madeline found repression absolutely impossible. Dorothy sat hugging her knees, her horror, at the story no greater than at Monty's unmistakable reference to her, and the finicalness of women. And Castleton, for the first time, appeared to be moved out of his imperturbability, though not in any sense of humor. And did he, he came to notice it, he was dumbfounded by the mirth. 
By Jove, you mighty kins are extraordinary people, he said. I don't see anything bloomin' funny about Mr. Pierce's story and his adventure. By Jove, the, that was a balmy warm occasion, Mr. Price, when you speak of being frightened for the only first time in your life. I appreciate what you mean. I have experienced that. I was frightened once. Duke, I wouldn't thought it of you, replied Monty. I'm sure tolerable curious to hear about it. Madeline and her friends dared not to break the spell, for fear that the Englishman might hold to his usual modest reprise. He had explored in Brazil and seen service in the Boer War, hunted in India and Africa, matters of experience of which he never spoke. Upon this occasion, however, evidently taking Monty's recital word for word as literal truth, and excited by it into a homeric mood, he might tell a story. The cowboys almost fell upon their knees at this chance. There was a suppressed eagerness in their quietness, a hint of something that meant more than desire, great as it was to hear a story told that by the English lord. Madeline divined instantly that the cowboys had suddenly fancied that Castleton was not the dense and easily fooled person that they had made fun of. Though he had played his part well, he was having fun at their expense, that he meant to tell a story, a lie which would simply dwarf Monty's. Nell's keen, bright expectation suggested how he would welcome the joke turned upon Monty. The slow closing of Monty's smile... The gradual sinking of his proud bearing, the doubt with which he began to regard Castleton, these were proofs of his fears. I was facing charging tigers and elephants in India, and charging rhinos and lions in Africa, began Castleton, his quick, fluent speech so different from the drawl of his ordinary conversation. But I was never frightened but once. It will not do to hunt these wild beasts if you are easily balled up. This adventure I have in mind happened in British East Africa, in Uganda. I was out in uh, the safari, and we were in a native district much infested by man-eating lions. Perhaps I may as well state that man-eaters are very different from ordinary lions. They are very mature beasts, and sometimes, indeed, mostly are old. They become man-eaters most likely by accident or necessity. When old, they find it more difficult to make a kill, being slower, probably, with poorer teeth driven with hunger. They stalk and kill a native, and once, having tasted human blood, they want no other. They become absolutely fearless and terrible in their attacks. The natives of this village near where we camped were in a terrorized state owing to the depredation of two or more man-eaters. The night of our arrival, a lion leaped a stockade fence and seized a native from among them, sitting round a fire, and leapt out again carrying the screaming fellow away into the darkness. I determined to kill these lions, and make a permanent camp in the village for that purpose. By day, I sent beaters into the bush and rocks of the river valley, and by night I watched. Every night, the lions visited us, but I did not see one. I discovered that when they roared around the camp, they were not liable to attack as when they were silent. It was indeed remarkable how silent they would stalk a man. They could creep through a thicket so dense you could not believe a rabbit could get through and do it without the slightest sound. Then, when ready to charge, they did so with a terrible onslaught and roar. They leaped right into the ring of the fires and tore down huts, even dragged natives from the low trees. There was no way to tell at which point they would make an attack. 
After ten days or more of this, I was worn out by loss of sleep. In one night, when tired out with watching, I fell asleep. My gun bearer was alone in the tent with me. A terrific roar awoke me, and then an unearthly scream pierced right into my ears. I always slept with a rifle in my hands, and grasping it I tried to rise, but I could not for the reason that a lion was standing over me. Then I lay still. The screams of my gun bearer told me that the lion had him. I was fond of this fellow and wished to save him. I thought it best, however, not to move while the lion stood over me. Suddenly he stepped, and I felt poor Luca's feet dragging across me. He screamed, Save me, master! And instantly I grasped at him and caught his foot. The lion walked out of the tent, dragging me as I held Luki's foot. The night was bright with moonlight. I could see the lion distinctly. He was a huge, black-maned brute, and he held Luki by the shoulder. The poor lad screamed frightfully, and the man-eater must have dragged me forty yards before he came aware of the dumb double encumbrance of his progress. Then he halted, and he turned. By Jove, he made a devilish fierce object with his shaggy, massive head, his green fire eyes, and his huge jaws locking upon Luki. I let go of Luki's foot, and bethought myself of a gun. But as I lay there on my side before attempting to rise, I made a horrible discovery. I did not have my rifle. I had Luki's iron spear, which he had always had with him. My rifle had slipped out of the hollow of my arm, and when the lion awoke me in my confusion, I picked up the spear instead. The bloody brute dropped Luki and uttered a roar that shook the ground. It was then I felt frightened. For an instant, I was paralyzed. The lion meant to charge, and for an instant, I was still paralyzed. And in one spring, he would reach me. Under circumstances like those, a man can think many things in a little time. I knew if I tried to run, it'd be fatal. I remembered how strangely lions had been known to act upon occasions. One had been frightened by an umbrella, one had been frightened by a blast from a cow horn, and another had been frightened by a native, who, in running from one lion, ran right into another, which he had not seen. Accordingly, I wondered if I might frighten the lion that meant to leap at me. Acting upon wild impulse, I prodded him in the hind quarters with the spear. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a blooming idiot if that lion did not cower like a whimpered dog and put his tail down and began to slink away. Quick to see my chance, I jumped up and yelled and made after him, prodding him again. He let out a bellow such as you could imagine would come from an outraged king of the beasts. I prodded him again, and then he loped off. I found Loki not badly hurt. In fact, he got well again. But I shall never forget that scare. When Castleton finished his narration, there was a treacherous silence. All eyes were upon Monty. He looked beaten, disgraced, and disgusted. Yet there shone from his face an admiration for Castleton. Duke, you win he said, and dropping his head, he left the campfire circle with the manner of a disposed emperor. Then the cowboys exploded. The quiet, serene, low-voiced Nels yelled like a madman, and he stood on his head. All the other cowboys went through marvelous contortions. Mere noise was insufficient to relieve their joy at what they considered the fall and the humiliation of the tyrant Monty. The Englishman stood there 
watching them in amused consternation. They baffled his understanding. Plain it was to Madeline and her friend that Castleton had told the simple truth, but never on the earth or anywhere else could Nels and his compadres have been persuaded that Castleton had not lied deliberately to humble their great adversary. Everybody seemed reluctant to break the campfire spell. The logs had burned to a great heap of opal and gold and red coals, in the heart of which a quivering and glow allured to the spirit of dreams. As the blaze subsided, the shadows of the pines encroached darker and darker upon the circle of fading light. A cool wind fanned the embers, whipping up flakes of white ash and moaning through the trees. The wild yelps of coyotes were dying in the distance and the sky was a wonderful dark blue dome spandangled with white stars. What a perfect night, said Madeline. This is a night to understand the dream, the mystery, the wonder of the southwest. Florence, for long you have promised to tell us the story of the lost minds of the Padres. It would give us all pleasure, making us understand something of the thrall in which this land held the Spaniards who discovered it so many years ago. It will simply be something interesting now, because this mountain hides somewhere under these crags the treasures of that lost mine. In the sixteenth century, Florence began in her slow, soft voice so suited to the nature of the legend. A young, poor padre of New Spain was shepherding his goats upon a hill when the virgin appeared before him. He prostrated himself at her feet, and when he looked up she was gone, but upon the plant near where she had stood was gold and ashes of a strange, wonderful substance. He took the incident as a good omen, and went down again to the hilltop. Under the flowers had sprung up slender stalks of white, bearing that were gold flowers, and as these flowers waved in the wind, a fine golden dust, as fine as powdered ashes, blew away towards the north. Padre Juan was mystified, but believed that great fortune attended upon him and his poor people. So he went again, and again to the hilltop, in hope that the virgin would appear upon him. One morning, as the sun rose gloriously, he looked across the windy hill towards the waving grass and golden flowers, and he saw the virgin beckoning to him. Again he fell to his knees, but she lifted him up and gave him of the golden flowers and bade him leave his home and people and follow where those golden ashes led. And there he would find gold, pure gold, wonderful fortune to bring back to his poor people to build a church for them and a city. Padre Juan took the flowers, left his home, promising to return, and they traveled northward over the hot and dusty desert, through the mountain passes to a new country where fierce warlike Indians menaced his life. He was gentle and good and of persuasive speech. Moreover, he was young and handsome of person, the Indians were Apache, and among them he became a missionary, while always he was searching for the flowers of gold. He heard of gold laying in the pebbles upon mountain slopes, but he never found any. A few of the Apaches he coveted, and most of them, however, were prone to be hostile to him and his religion. But Padre Juan prayed and worked on. There came a time when the old Apache chief, imagining the Padre had designs Upon his influence with the tribe, sought to put him to death by fire. The chief's daughter, a beautiful, dark-eyed maiden, secretly loved Juan and believed in his mission, and she interceded for his life and saved him. Juan fell in love with her. One day she came to him wearing golden flowers in her dark hair, and as the wind blew the flowers, a golden dust blew upon it. Madeline asked her where to find such flowers and she told him that upon a certain day she would take him to the mountains to look for them. Upon the day she led up to the mountain top, from which they could see beautiful valleys and great trees and cool water. There 
at the top of the wonderful slope that looked down upon the world, she showed Juan the flowers. And Juan found gold in such abundance that he thought he would lose his mind. Dust of gold, grains of gold, pebbles of gold, rocks of gold. He was rich beyond all dreams. He remembered the Virgin and her words. He must return to his people and build their church in the great city that would bear his name. But Juan tarried. Always he was going to Menena. He loved the dark-eyed Apache girl so well that he could not leave her. He hated himself for his infidelity to his virgin to his people. He was weak and false a sinner, but he could not go, and he gave himself to the love of the Indian maiden. The old Apache chief discovered the secret love of his daughter in the Padre, and fierce in his anger, he took her up into the mountains and burdened her alive and cast her ashes upon the wind. He did not kill Padre Juan. He was too wise and perhaps too cruel, for he saw the strength of Juan's love. Besides, many of his tribe had learned much from the Spaniard. Padre Juan fell in despair. He no longer had a desire to live. He faded and wasted away, but before he died, he went to the old Indians who had burned the maiden, and he begged them, when he was dead, to burn his body and cast his ashes to the wind upon that magnificent slope where they would blow away to mingle forever with those of his Indian sweetheart. The Indian promised, and when Padre Juan died, they burned his body and took his ashes to the mountain heights and cast them to the wind, where they drifted and fell to mix with the ashes of the Indian girl he loved. Years passed. More Padres traveled across the desert to the home of the Apaches, and they heard the story of Juan. Among their number was a Padre who in his youth had been one of Juan's people. He set forth to find Juan's grave where he believed he would also find the gold, and he came back with pebbles of gold and flowers that shed a golden dust, and he told a wonderful story. He had climbed and climbed into the mountains, and he had come to a wonderful slope under the crags. That slope was yellow with golden flowers. When he touched the golden ashes, they drifted from them and blew down among the rocks, and there... The Padre found dusts of gold, grains of gold, pebbles of gold, rocks of gold. Then all the Padres went into the mountains, but the discoverer of the mine lost his way. They searched and they searched until they were old and gray, but never found the wonderful slope and flowers that marked the grave and the mine of Padre Juan. In the succeeding years, the story was handed down from father to son, but many who hunted for the lost mine for the Padres that had never seen a Mexican or an Apache. For the Apache, the mountain slopes were haunted by the spirit of the Indian maiden, who had been false to her tribe and forever accursed. For the Mexican, the mountain slopes were haunted by the spirit of the false Padre, who rolled stones upon the heads of those adventurers who sought his grave and his cursed gold. End of chapter 17